such a beautiful start to a new year. We have a, as was already noted, we have a really good number out today and very encouraged to see all of you and your commitment to the Lord, your dedication and your love for Him and your wisdom to seek Him first at the first of this year. And it is already a tremendous blessing for us to see this year. It's, uh, it's exciting. It really is to have a new calendar, a new opportunity, new slate, new goals, new perspective, and a new zeal to do better than we did before. And it's all by the mercy of God, and we give Him all the glory and all the credit. And yet it's, uh, it's so good to see you, friends. Very thankful for you. Had a really good week. I was encouraged by the number of teachers who were up here all week, just about every day this week, working on the classes. I love the emphasis of the classes here and the great concern and determination to do really well in teaching God's Word. And it was just encouraging to see that, people preparing for services today even. And then uh, Monday morning I came, got here, and there was some sticky notes. There was a sticky note on the side do door over here where I normally come in and uh, said shine bright today Mr. Mike and I don't know who wrote that but I thank you because that put a big smile on my face it just really made me feel good uh, got to my office and I noticed at the end of the hallway in the back door there was another sticky note from the same person it said um, happy happy day Mr. Thomason not sure who that is but I'm going to get that to him uh, Mr. Thomason I am Mike Thomas. You do know that, right? That is my, Mike Thomas is my name. No, I, I appreciate whoever did that. Very thoughtful, and it really, uh, it did make me shine bright that day. So I wanted to thank you for that. But, like I said, it's just a good day for us to, to start over in our relationship with God and our service to Him. And... In looking at was already stated how we have a really good thought to develop this year on finding God's purpose for us to know how we can better serve him and learn more about what he wants us to learn and accomplish while we're here and of course to see what is in store for us in this year Lord willing if God allows time to continue what more does he want us to accomplish? What more does he want us to experience and to pursue while we are here? And to encourage us in this, we've gone to the Word of God in various passages to see various thoughts we can use to develop this thought. And as we can see here, it, it, there's so much that God wants from us that we can know in regard to even our family, as we'll talk about, Lord willing, next month, from strengthening the church to proclaiming His Word, and just keep going through the year, and we see that ultimately it's about us getting to heaven in that crown of life. That's certainly God's ultimate purpose for all of us. But this morning, we want to consider this first thought of God raising up people to do His will and to accomplish His purpose and how we can look in the Scriptures and see how God is in control. He is using this world to do whatever He wants, especially in accomplishing His ultimate will. And we can see that even in times past, you can go to sections of history and see that things unfolded the way they did because of God's purpose and God's ability to use this world to accomplish his purpose. I see this first mentioned, at least predominantly to me, when you go back to Pharaoh and how, of course, the people of God were in bondage to Egypt and it was God's will for them to be released and to go and worship him in the wilderness. That's what he was telling Pharaoh to do. Let my people go. Let them go make this sacrifice and worship to me. But, of course, his response was, Who is the, I don't know this Lord. Who is he that I should obey him? That was his attitude. And so God sent a series of plagues to try and convince Pharaoh to let his people go. Starting out, well, really the first sign was Moses throwing the rod down, Aaron throwing the rod down and becoming a, a snake. And we know that the magicians of Pharaoh were able to do the same thing, even though God's serpent swallowed up theirs. Still wasn't enough to change Pharaoh's thoughts. 
Uh, the first plague was that God turned every body of water into blood. That there was no water for the people of Egypt to have. Seven days it was like this. In the wells, and the buckets, and any body of water was blood. And you would think that would have been enough for Pharaoh to say, okay, that's who this God is, and I want no part of him. But it wasn't. He was determined to hold his ground, and so God sent in some frogs coming from every part of their life. Frogs were everywhere. That moved Pharaoh to say, okay, let's let these people go. But when the frogs were gone, he changed his mind again. And so God sent in other plagues like that of lice. And every time a plague came in, the magicians were able to duplicate it in some way, at least enough to convince Pharaoh they had just as much power. But when they got to lice, even they said, this is the finger of God, we can't do this one. And I love that phrase, this is the finger of God. So even they knew, okay, we're dealing with a powerful person here. Still wasn't enough to convince him. So it was plague after plague after plague, and he would come and go, changing his mind for a little bit, and then reverting back to this idea of, I'm not going to let these people go. And so we come to the seventh plague. And in Exodus chapter 9, God is saying, okay, I've got one more I'm going to send you. But I'm going to give you a chance to do the right thing. Because he says in Exodus chapter 9, in verses 15 and 16, he says, I could have wiped you out by now. He's telling Pharaoh this. In verse 15, if I had stretched out my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence, then you would have been cut off from the earth. But indeed, for this purpose, I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. So there you have an example of God allowing a per person to see a certain level of accomplishment and success and is saying that this is happening because I'm letting it happen. And I'm letting it happen because I want to demonstrate my power through you and really my power over you. And so that's what he meant by saying I have raised you up for this purpose. And so if we're going to develop a thought for the year of the purpose of God, then obviously we would all be wiser to realize we are dealing with a God who has the ability to carry out his purpose. He has the ability to do what he wants in accomplishing his will. He can use this world to do that. And that is, that is way too easy for him to do. And there are reasons why we can know that he has this ability. Number one is because he has eternal power. God is supreme in all that he can do. And that's what he says in Exodus chapter 9 when he goes back and he says, look, I'm going to give you a chance to do the right thing here. I'm going to send a plague and it's going to tear things up and you have a chance to respond to this before it happens. He says this in Exodus chapter 9. I go back and read verse 13. The Lord said to Moses, Rise early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord God of the Hebrews, Let my people go, that they may serve me. For at this time I will send all my plagues to your very heart and on your servants and on your people, that you may know there is none like me in all the earth. If I had stretched out my hand and struck you or your people with pestilence, then you would have been cut off from the earth. But indeed, for this purpose, I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth, as you exalt yourself against my people, and that you will not let them go. Behold, tomorrow about this time I will cause very heavy hail to rain down, such as not been, uh, has not been in Egypt since its founding until now. And so he gives them a choice. And he's given them a warning. Now there were some who did hear this and they brought in their servants and their animals and they were spared. But the rest who didn't listen, they lost everything from this hailstorm. But it was showing God's ability. And so starting out, we need to realize we serve a God who is exceedingly powerful. Because that's what he was going to do through them. Why did Egypt have the success they did? How come Egypt has never had that success, level of success since then? God raised them up. And he allowed them to find all this success so that he could show his dominance over men. In Exodus chapter 14, that's what he said in summary 
in talking about this, in Exodus chapter 14 and verses 17 and 18, he says, I will indeed harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they shall follow them. So I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army, his chariots and his horsemen. Then the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gained honor for myself over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. And they were. This was the most dominant nation in the world. Egypt was. And Pharaoh was at the top of that. And yet God surpassed even him in, in, when it comes to a battle of will. And it worked. I mean, he said, I, I, want, I set them up on a platform so that the entire world can know about me and my name. And sure enough, when he did defeat Egypt and Pharaoh and his army, and the people were let go, the very first city that the Israelites encountered when they were taking the land of Canaan was Jericho. And the reason why Rahab was willing to help the spies out, knowing they were of the enemy, so to speak, they were of the Israelites, she said the reason she was doing this is because we heard about what your God did in drying up the Red Sea, in Joshua chapter 2, 9 and 10. And so it worked. God was going to exert his power over Egypt to, to, to show the world you're dealing with a very special person here in dealing with God. Well, if, if that's what he wanted them to see, why would it be any different for us in reading the story? Is it not to impress upon us that we are dealing with a God who has the power to do what he wants and who can use time to accomplish his will? Can he not do that still today? In Romans chapter 9, that is the conclusion Paul is making when he goes back to the accounts we just read and how Pharaoh was stubborn and yet God kept requiring Pharaoh to do something he did not want to do and ultimately God had the final say. Well, he tells us about that in Romans chapter 9 so that we might remember that God has the final say and that we are living truly by his mercy and it's as if we are clay in the potter's hand. How much authority does a potter have over the clay? How much authority does the master have over that which he is shaping and that which is he, he's developing? He has complete control. And that's the image we see in Romans chapter 9 when it comes to God. That he is a God who has complete control. Now he allows free will. He allowed Pharaoh to make his choices. But he was able to work through the choices of men to see that his desire was complete. In Romans chapter 9, read with me and notice in verse 14, beginning, what shall we say then? Is there any unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. Now stop right there. Pharaoh didn't want him to have mercy on the Israelites, but God did. And Pharaoh wasn't going to stop that. So then, in verse 16, it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Therefore, he has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills he hardens. Now obviously, Paul's dovetailing that into all of us being saved especially as Gentiles through Christ. But it goes back to what happened with Pharaoh in this battle of the will. In verse 19, it goes on to say in Romans 9, You will then say to me, Why does he still find fault? For who has resisted his will? But indeed, O man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing formed say to him who formed it, Why have you made me like this? Does not the potter have power over the clay? from the same lump to make one vessel for honor and another for dishonor. Now the point I want us to see is we see who's in ultimate control from all of this, and that is God. So as we're looking at this quest of finding God's purpose for us, well, let us all gather around the point and the fact immediately from day one realizing, okay, he has control, not me. He's the one with all the power, not me. I live by his mercy. I am as clay in the potter's hand. 
Now, we're not going to sing this, uh, at least at this point of the service, but it's a good song, you know, and reminding us of this fact. Number 111, O Lord, you know my strength indeed is small. Lest thou should lead, I am prone to slip and fall. Guide and direct, or evil help me stand. Make me as clay in the potter's hand. So that's the idea of somebody saying, look, God, you can do this. You have control. Make me into something that will bring you glory and honor, something that will triumph over evil. You have your way with me. Verse 2, Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Make of my life as pleases thee each day. Weave into beauty as you have planned, have it planned. Make me as clay in the potter's hand. So what a beautiful prayer. God, you take my life. You take our life from 2000, the first day of 2000. 21, you do what you want with us this year. We are here for you and your glory and your honor. What a beautiful way to start out the year as we seek his purpose. Verse 3, Father, we pray for power to be strong. Let not our lives be marred by sin and wrong. Lead to thy throne by love. Take full command. Make us as clay in the potter's hand. Mold me, make me as you'd have me be. Take me, use me that the lost may see. Guard me, guide me through this pilgrim land. Make me as clay in the potter's hand. And from what I can see is he is very much capable of doing that. If he could mold Pharaoh and his circumstance into his will, showing mercy when Pharaoh didn't want to show mercy, he can do it with us. He can use us to do great things. Well, going back to this idea of God raising people up, I think it's good to also realize that God can do us not because He has the eternal power to do it, but God has the eternal perspective to carry this out. And here's what I mean by that. Is that He is not bound by time like you and I are bound. Now, even this image, I tried to find some way of depicting it. And so you have this idea of time. Like you have a, a, a timeline or even a line with a beginning and an end. And, and that's time. We understand. That's all we know is time. But God is not bound by time. He, he transcends a time. Time is just for us. And so we have to understand that we are dealing with a God who can see the whole thing as one unit. He can see the complete picture. In Isaiah chapter 40, it says in verse 21 through 23, this is what he's saying in looking at life and how we can know he has the ability to carry out a purpose because he is far above us in his ability to, to, to perceive. In Isaiah chapter 40, notice this where our God has it said of him in verse 21, Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth. And its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. He brings the princes to nothing and he makes judges of the earth useless. So what he's saying is he transcends all this. He can stretch it out like a curtain. So he is far above this, this earth and everything you and I can do. And because of that, he can guide us and direct us in certain ways to accomplish certain things because he can see things we cannot see. And he's always been this way. How in the world was prophecy effective? How in the world could God give predictions through these people hundreds of years before they occurred and actually had them document it? In history, saying, this is going to happen. This person's going to rise up. This nation's going to fall. This is going to come about. He was able to predict this with accuracy. Hundreds and hundreds of years before they actually happened. How is that? It's because he's not bound by time. He can see how all this ends. He can see into the future. In fact, when you look at the prophecy regarding the Messiah and the one who would come and die for sin. Notice how it says, even in talking about this in Isaiah 53 in verse 9, it talks about the way he would be buried. In Isaiah chapter 53 in verse 9, they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was deceit in his mouth. So you've got to find somebody who's going to die for sin as if a wicked person 
numbered with the transgressors, and yet he's going to be buried like a rich person. How in the world does that happen? And we know the fulfillment of that was what? Joseph of Arimathea, a wealthy man, came and got a brand new grave and gave it as the place to bury the body of Christ. How could he see this? 700 years before it happened, he could see that the Messiah was dying for sin, and yet even in the midst of all that, a rich person was going to bury him? How could that be? Well, we serve a God who can see the end. You and I can't. We're in the middle of the timeline. We, we, on the, in the line, we're, we're right there. We're a dot on the line. We can't see the end. Like he, but he can see the whole thing. And because of that, he knows that there are those who are going to choose good, Joseph of Arimathea, and he could tell who's going to choose evil. Let me ask you this. Why was Jesus distressed about his pending death? Why did it bother him? It bothered him because he knew it was coming. With great precision, he knew it was coming. In Matthew chapter 20, he was able to see how it all specifically unfolded for him. And that's why he was in so much anguish. In Matthew chapter 20, notice where it says in verses 17 through 19, Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the twelve disciples aside on the road and said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify. And the third day he will rise again. Can you imagine knowing when you were going to die, but especially if it was a painful death and you knew that with precision, they're going to scourge me. They're going to crucify me. They're going to do all these things to me. I know who's going to do it. How is that possible? How could he spell it out with great precision before it ever happened? At least a week before, this last time he was predicting it. He could see the end. Our God has the ability to see into the future. That's why it says in Genesis 15 and verse 6 that when God told Abram that you're going to have as many descendants as the stars in the sky... Abram was an old man, and yet he believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness because God could see into that man's heart and knew he believed God. That if he were given thousands of years on this earth, he would live every year with confidence God would eventually fulfill that promise. And so my question is, if he could see it with them, can he see it with us? What does he see in you? Does he see in you a person who is like, mold me, make me, do whatever you want? Or does he look into our heart and see exactly what he saw in the days of Noah, where he could see that even though the world had adults and children present, God could still look across the landscape and say, okay, the heart of this people is gone. They're only on evil continually, even though you had children in the world who did not have knowledge of good and evil, but God could see what was coming from their heart. They were corrupt. They were hopeless. And if I understand it correctly, that's the same thing that's going to happen when he brings this thing to an end. When he sees there are nobody left who have that desire to serve him and come to repentance, he will bring it to an end. He can look down the road. I, I just so happened to see this when I was reading through Kings recently, and Jeroboam, you read this sometime on your own in 1 Kings 14. Here's a man who did wicked, who was a wicked king, leading people away from God. One of his sons was sick and was about to die. And he was hoping that God would change his mind and spare the boy, but God said, no, we're gonna, he's not going to make it. He's going to die in a way that's peculiar from the other children, because I see something in him is what it says in 1 Kings chapter 14, verses 12 and 13. God could look into that boy's heart and see that he would be a righteous person. And so he spared him by taking his life. That's the person we're dealing with here. How can God raise people up for his purpose? 
It's because he can see the whole thing. And as a result, he can use time to accomplish his will. And that's why I want to sum this up by saying this. God has an eternal purpose. He fulfilled his purpose through Pharaoh in dominating him. And he has the ability to still fulfill his purpose. Isaiah chapter 46, it says this in verses 8 through 11, where I read for us where it says, Remember this and show yourselves men. Recall to mind, O you transgressors, remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times things that are not yet done saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Calling a bird of prey from the east, the man who executes my counsel from a far country, indeed I have spoken it. I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it. I will also do it. It just makes sense to me. If we're going to talk about the concept of purpose and God's, it's sufficient for me to realize, okay, we're dealing with a person who carries it out. When he sets his mind to do something, he does it. And you can see that in time he was able to accomplish his great purpose of redemption, which as it says in Romans chapter 16, this plan was a mystery for so many years, but God knew what he was doing and he was manipulating time to bring this purpose about. And we can see that's exactly what he's done in Jesus, in the cross, in his church. Romans chapter 16 says in verses 25 through 27, to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began, but now made manifest and by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations according to the commandment of their everlasting God. Now what he's saying is God was able to use time to bring the cross about, to redeem man. And you can see even here, this is what God was working toward all those years of blessing all people through Abraham's family. It was bringing Jesus about to save us from sin. And that God envisioned the church, the age in which you and I live. He had that in mind before time began. And of course, all of this is pointing toward eternity and hopefully eternity with him. What do we know about God's purpose? Well, here's the answer. You know as much as he wants you to know. The secret things belong to God, Deuteronomy 29 and verse 29. He didn't reveal everything back then, but in time it did come out. The mystery was made known. And the same thing is true for us today. He has not revealed when he's coming back. Only he knows that date. Matthew 24 and verse 36. But we can know it's going to happen because he says it's going to happen. But here's the whole point of all this. I tried to think, okay, so what's the point of all this? Here's the point. Here's what you and I can walk away with today. Despite all the wonderful things we've thought about with our God, here it is. You take this and you take it home with you, Lord willing, today. We can know that everything he wants from us is based on what we see right here. He wants us to come to the cross. He wants us to be saved in the gospel. He wants us to be a member of His church. He wants His church to be vibrant and active and living. And He wants His people in eternity with Him. And everything He tells us to do is going to be based on that premise of getting us to heaven with Him and accomplishing His will while we are here. So what do we do? Well, here's what you and I do. We trust and obey Him. We trust that He is a God who is powerful, yes, but He's also merciful and loving. We trust Him, knowing that His will will be done, and we ask for mercy in understanding that. And just because His goal is to get us into eternity with Him does not mean we can't pray for our family, or we can't pray for our community, or do our part in strengthening even this local church. That's His purpose as well, and I hope to, Lord willing, develop that as time goes on. But we start out understanding, not my will, your will be done. God, what's your purpose for me today? Here's my purpose for you. Let my will live through you. Trust me. Lean on me. Define your life by me. Give your life to me. 
In Matthew chapter 26 and verse 39, it is illustrated so well in Jesus. He went a little farther, fell on his face and prayed, Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Now, was it possible for that cup to pass? Well, he knew he couldn't do it. He had to die to save us from sin. Didn't want to, but he was willing to do it. But notice his attitude. This is what I want, but I want what you want. Your will be done. And give me the strength to do it. And I hope that's our attitude today. Your will be done. And give me the strength to do it and use me to accomplish your purpose while I'm here. Thank you, friends. I appreciate you listening. I hope some things were said to impress us in our thinking about our Creator. But listen, what better way to start out a year than to start out with all of our sins forgiven? If you're here and you're not a child of God, we sing the invitation song, not just hopefully out of a vain habit. We do this because we sincerely want you to obey the gospel to have all your sins forgiven. There is really no better way for you to start this year, start this day, than to have all your sins forgiven. And if I knew of another way to tell you to be saved, I would tell you. But based on what I see from the Word of God, here's the message. If you want redemption, it's not through me or this church, it's through Jesus who died for you and came back from the dead. If you believe that, and you're willing to acknowledge that before men, and turn away from every sin you know of, Acts 17 and verse 30, will you be buried with him in baptism to raise to walk in newness of life? Romans chapter 6, and will you be faithful unto death? It could be you've done that, but haven't been living a faithful life, or you need the prayers of the church here, or you need to make things right with God in a public way. Listen, we're all on the same journey we all have the same struggles, and we all need the same mercy. So if you're subject to the Lord's invitation, please come to Him as we stand and sing.